Gulf Travel Show presents an exclusive and insightful interaction with the senior advisor to the Tourism Ministry of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, friends. Depends on what time you are hearing this. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, we have different kind of leaders in the world. Some are leaders who are hoteliers, some are leaders who are uh, in the aviation sector, some are leaders in the tourism world sector. Uh, they know their uh, work very, very well, and they do a good job. But there are very few uh, leaders who do maybe one or two industries together. Today, uh, we have one such person who is a leader in his own right. He is a global leader. He has a vision, global vision. And to top it off, he is one person who is, who is headed hotel chains and he's also headed tourism boards. So he knows both sides of the coin, which are, the, which are really important at the moment for the tourism industry to know where it is going and what's happening. In fact, it's under him that the regional brands, actually, he gave them global recognition. That's, that's the kind of image he has globally. So great friends, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome none other than uh, Haitha Mutter, who has been, who actually doesn't need introduction. In fact, all of you know him very well in the region. And today we are going to actually talk to him and discuss with him uh, what's happening in the industry. Uh, this pandemic, how long is going to go on? We really want him to uh, light up his crystal ball and tell us a few things of what's going to be happening and where this industry is going to go. So let's get started. Let's let's ask him some pertinent questions. Haitham, welcome today. Uh, pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, and we look forward to some great advice and learning from you. Sanzi, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And, and thank you for this uh, uh, introduction, which uh, I think is a bit more than I deserve, uh, but I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think I've worked with you and I, can, I know you well. I know how you think and uh, there's never, um, you take a second to reply to messages, which is unbelievable. So you're right. a good man in your own word. So uh, that's something which is fantastic. Okay, right. just with uh, the obvious question which we want to ask is, you have this vast experience and knowledge of the region and you have seen international part of it also. What, according to you, is the current uh, trend in the GCC region? What's going to be happening there? So, look, and I would uh, really refer back to a lot of uh, insights, research, and studies that have been conducted recently by various consultants to include McKinsey, uh, the forecasts that we see from SDR, um, uh, the research that's recently by, by, done by Inmarsat in terms of travel. Um, and if we look at the trends that um, uh, have occurred from the start of the pandemic until now, we know up to 50% of the hotels across the Middle East were closed. Um, now that's down to about 10% of the hotels uh, closed uh, as of November, as of this month uh, across the Middle East. However, if, uh, if you look at the, the uh, trends of uh, uh, troughs and, 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 and surges and in, in drops in, in, in occupancies is uh, uh, very much changing every time we have news about the pandemic, right? So this uncertainty about the pandemic of uh, opening borders, closing borders, uh, lockdowns, no lockdowns, curfew, no, no curfew is, is changing the, the travel trends and, and behavioral trends. It's also impacting the confidence of people wanting to travel, especially for leisure. And, 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 and even business to, to some extent. Now, the occupancies across the region in, in the GCC is forecasted by uh, or reported by SDR has been nudging 50%. Now that's actually, the Middle East has been performing a lot stronger than Europe, Asia Pac, or even the United States. It's both on, both on average rate as well as occupancy. Um, the trends we see now on cities is becoming less desirable because people don't necessarily want to go to uh, big hotels, conglomerating groups, um, uh, crowded areas. So rural areas and, and destinations that are um, offering uh, 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 nature, outdoor adventure experiences are becoming more and more popular. We've seen also a big shift now for um, uh, trends from both uh, investors as well as consumers looking more for the what we call the glamping the luxury camp accommodation which 
if you recall, I started working on that for Russell Hema about four years ago. And that's, that's really becoming something very popular across, uh, across the world. Um, that really, again, has to do with, you know, the confidence or lack of confidence with how um, people feel about hotels handling, handling hygiene and cleanliness and, and uh, safety. Uh, but but tell me, uh, <clears throat> for example, you, you depended upon research. But my next question is, is 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 actually related to that. When you talk about research, research is as strong as its weakest link because you know things are changing literally on a weekly basis. Uh, we talked about Europe and everybody thought it's booming and now everything is coming under lockdown. So uh, how much would you really stress on research? Because uh, my question with this is that what should the travel industry in the Middle East actually learn? From this pandemic, is there yeah. anything? And what do you think? So, would will be when we think so, we will return back to the pre-COVID area. How much? So what, what I mentioned before that I touched on two points. So, one is research, and the other is insights. So, the research is one thing, and you're, you're absolutely right in terms of research. It's I always say what people say in a survey and what they actually do are sometimes not the same thing. Um, and and whilst the research and respondents. Uh, views are a guide basically on you know how we feel people are going to behave um, that could also change depending on uh, uh, you know many variables including the uh, uh, the ease on uh, lockdowns the ease on travel uh, more restrictions or less restrictions that is really going to change behaviors almost daily sometimes so depending on what city you live in right the insights uh, where you see trends of occupancies, right? You see that the Middle East region, for example, is performing stronger. Um, we saw in the UAE, Dubai in particular, open borders and started to open hotels back again. We saw that surge in, in occupancy. It is not anywhere close to 2019. It is not anywhere close to forecast, but it is touching 50% um, um, occupancy uh, in, in Dubai and in the UAE in general. Now, if we think destinations like Ras Al Khaimah that offer, you know, a, a, a more of a, the outdoor nature, uh, uh, um, uh, away from crowded cities um, uh, uh, experiences, it has allowed Ras Al Khaimah to capitalize more on the um, staycation and also for people who want to get away from uh, these crowded cities in the same way in Abu Dhabi, where you see Yas Island and, and Sadiyat have really capitalized on this. So what, going back to tr trends again is the trends will be for these sort of destinations uh, uh, less on people seeking city breaks. I used to be a, 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 a traveler who always seeked city breaks. So going to Mumbai and to Delhi and going through you know, the streets of Delhi and Mumbai, that was the experiences I always uh, looked for and, and many travelers around the world did. City Breaks is actually uh, one of the largest travel um, uh, motivators. However, um, we see this trending less with people looking for, as I said, if we look in Saudi Arabia, for example, in, a, in the mountainous areas of Asir and Baha and Suda were extremely popular during the summer, as people wanted to get away from the big cities of Riyadh, Jeddah, and go to these uh, these these cities, so uh, uh, the the, uh, the the trend for the future is going to probably remain until some time where people don't want to be in these big cities. We look at business travel at the same time. Business travel has reduced tremendously, correct now, and also the confidence in business travel uh, has not really come back yet. Why? Because of the quarantine. Now, business travel is a short stay. You travel for a couple of days and you're back. It's not, it's not a leisure, regardless. But when, when let's say you want to come to, to, to a country that has a quarantine for two days. If you travel on business and you have to be in your hotel for two days before you can go out and meet face to face, you've actually just lost two days. So, and, and in some cases, depending on what country you come from, if you need to go home uh, from travel, you must quarantine for another two weeks. So that is still not giving people that confidence uh, for, for travel yet. So, so what you're saying is the new learning for the industry is now going to be uh, don't look at uh, business travel for some time until things open up and all that. So look at leisure and that also not the city, but uh, smaller towns. No, the thing, 
Uh, no, I think that the learning from the, the, to the industry is, and this is a question again, do we, do we really continue to constrain ourselves as an industry until the vaccine is out there and not think about innovative ways of how we can live with this pandemic, wearing masks, physical distancing, clean and hygiene, education, awareness, um, I mean, I'm, I'm back in, in Riyadh and our offices are back uh, in, in full operation, uh, but we have people wearing masks, physical distancing, um, ensuring clean and hygiene, education, um, and every organization has to make sure that they implement this. And we have people working on shifts, so you don't have a full team um, all at once. Now, it's, it's the new norm, nobody knows what it looks like. The new norm, nobody knows when it's going to just really start, right? Uh, as long as we have second waves and potential other waves um, and, and other mutations of, of this pandemic, we will not be certain. And until a vaccine is out for the public, for the world, I'm not talking a vaccine that's out for certain levels of society or a certain number of people, I'm talking about across the world, uh, the new norm, I don't think can be predicted. So it's, it's for us humans, to an industry experts to start thinking about innovate, innovative ways to restart mice, to restart business travel, to restart uh, uh, leisure. Um, but don't forget again, this is within a certain country. As soon as you want to start, travel across borders, you're constrained by government regulations, whether it's quarantine, um, 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 uh, whether it's uh, uh, expensive PCR tests, that's going to restrict people from wanting to travel. In some countries, the PCR tests, including in the US, is up to uh, close to three hundred dollars. Um, so it's not cheap to do a PCR test every time you want to you want to travel. Oh, I understand that. I'm bringing you back to the region, uh, and I want to pick up on pick on what you just now mentioned about about the new norms. And in fact, everybody's talking globally about the new normal, uh, especially, and, and I'm going to stay with hotels for the time being, everybody says that the hotels need to look at new normals, uh, things are going to change with the hotels. So my question really, as a hotel, I want to know, what is this new normal? Uh, is it just going to be hygiene and cleanliness? Is that it? Or are there going to be more changes in this so-called new normal, which is going to be or is going to happen now? You see, for those who start to, to travel, uh, during the, the pandemic now and, and restarted to stay in hotels and, and I'm one of those. Um, I can tell you the pandemic has taken the life out of uh, hotels and has taken the life and joy out of travel in general. Um, um, when you're on a, uh, I know you want to stay to hotels, but let's start with a flight. When you're on a flight now um, and if you're traveling in economy, you certainly don't want anybody in the middle seat. You're, you're very self-conscious and you're just worried about, you know, anybody getting way too close even within a meter from you, but yet alone, you know, sitting in economy, someone is only a couple of, of inches away from you. So that starts there. But when you arrive to hotel lobbies that have been cleared from, you know, any artifacts on the tables, it looks like, uh, sorry to say, but you're walking into a, a, a hospital, right? Everything is disinfected. Everything is so, 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 um, uh, so clean, um, which is, which is great, but it's that sense of walking into a hospital. Uh, is not anymore the same as walking into a grandiose hotel lobby. You know, the warmth of hospitality is, is taken away. The warmth of hospitality is, is human contact, is, 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 is facing, is handshaking, it's receiving, it's, right? That's, that's taken away. That's going to change um, the, the way um, people, and people react differently, and I'll come to that, the way people uh, choose hotels. Which hotel am I going to stay at? Which brand? We've seen big hotel chains such as Marriott, Accor, and Hilton lead the way, and IHG lead the way in announcing um, new hygiene standards, or you know, stay clean uh, uh, and, and and what have you. And those hygiene standards, you would think in a normal environment, should have been in place, right? You'd think all this, you know hygiene and cleanliness, it should be the normal stand, standard and not something that we introduce because of a pandemic. Now, of course, there's a high cost of operation on hotels to do you know, the extra uh, uh, cleaning standards that are done today and, and sanitization and before check-in and after check-out. 
Um, hotels probably will have to raise their prices in order to cope with that cost in order to continue uh, because uh, consumers will want to see that continue. It's not going to be something, you know, in the new norm that we discontinue the cleaning. Um, it's, 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 it's something that so we want to see going forward and that's going to add a cost. So that, that means there's going to be an impact on, on pricing uh, eventually. Um, also, um, the, the human interaction that's sort of uh, been removed, um, you know, you have now a waiter wearing a mask, you have uh, waiters wearing gloves. Uh, um, uh, at the same time, you have uh, the people in open kitchen wearing masks, wearing gloves. That's comforting. You know, you, you know that, that you, you know, things are becoming more and more hygiene. But like I keep repeating is that human touch. Uh, and, and, and human interaction is, is removed from the experience of travel and, and leisure and, and hospitality. I know this is, this is uh, taking the joy away from <clears throat> hotel staying compared to a hospital. I know I agree with you 100%. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's uh, move on from the, from the hotels and I think let's get into the tourism boards and especially at the destination uh, well, the destinations actually have a huge and a very, very important role to play. Uh, they are they're the people who really have to maintain uh, the growth. They have to show sustainability. Uh, that's the message they are giving at the moment. How important is and what do you think so the destination should be doing at the moment? Just sending out the message or they should be training their people or they should be setting the perception right or they should be de developing new uh, different destinations or smaller hotels and others which are far away and all that. So what, what is the new role of a destination now? Again, look, I, I, I like to always have discussions that are uh, informed. So if we, if we go back to Google searches and what Google has been reporting on searches, people are continuing to search for holidays for destinations. Uh, they search for holidays that they're familiar with um, and they yearn for it. So people who miss Paris and miss the Eiffel Tower they, they don't miss the Champs Elysees. People who miss London, they do the searches, and these searches have dips and drops. You know, as as news come up uh, on ease of travel, you see the surges, and as soon as you hear anything about lockdowns, you see that which is normal. Now, the um, uh, destinations um, in some countries have decided to hold back on spending uh, on marketing, for example, and. Um, if you think about any particular destination, destination X, destination X it decides that it has a certain competitive set when it's the same time it's competing with the world. Because when I go to search, either I already have something on my mind where I want to go, or I want to repeat a visit to a destination I yearn for, or I'd like to explore something new. So it's how destinations position themselves and how often they are top of mind for consumers, this is when the conversion, if you like, so you know, you build the desire, the curiosity, uh, um, and then you, you need to get to the conversion stage, right? So the, the, the building the, the excitement and the curiosity that we've seen throughout the pandemic and, and, and many destinations did an amazing job, like Portugal, the, the video that Portugal destination Portugal has done, Greece was one of the most amazing videos throughout the pandemic in, in keeping uh, the, 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 the country and, and the destination in, in touch with people and top of mind. So telling people we're waiting for you to come back when this is all over. Uh, uh, telling people that, look, it is important that we have to stop today. It is important that we are away from each other today. It is. We're always, we're stronger to, together, but today we're stronger being apart, right? These are great messages that went out to public where people would have continued to resonate with these destinations and want to go visit as soon as borders open. So I think a destination strategy today that was um, uh, built prior to the pandemic um, will certainly need a revision. It needs to re be revisited. Uh, targets needs to be revisited and be, be more realistic. Um, um, and, and really important is the communications and marketing strategy, talking to people in various stages of, let's call, 
what and when is the new norm going to happen, right? So you're building up to that uh, to that time. I have recently complimented Dubai for their global campaign that they have uh, put out. We've seen this on CNN. We've seen this on social media. Um, I think this is a really great way to, to um, showcase a destination and its offering. Um, and I believe also the timing was uh, good considering that they had opened their borders. Now, um, the, the impact in, in Europe today with the, the uh, uh, close, with the uh, lockdown in the UK, soft lockdown in Germany, in France, um, that's going to impact outbound or delay, let's say, the recovery, right? But when, when, when destinations like Dubai or any other destinations, Portugal or what have you, have, have continued to communicate to consumers, right? reminding them and exciting them of wanting to go as soon as the borders are open. This is where I believe destinations like this are going to benefit most and be able to reap the fruits of their doings and their, their strategy and their uh, implementation of those plans. But what you're saying in that way is that those destinations who keep their marketing going on and on continues, and they're setting the and changing their perception, setting it correct, sending the right message, are the ones who will benefit in the long run in the future. I absolutely think the the communications, the continued communications, being at top of mind and front of mind with consumers is what's going to make them a potential choice for consumers rather than those who've gone quiet. Right? So we've seen destinations who've gone completely quiet, just waiting for uh, borders to open and things to improve. And we've seen those who have been extremely innovative, creative, and in keeping in touch, right? continuing to talk to people and consumers and travelers and excite them right? about, about the destinations and reminding them about the uh, great offerings that they have, the, the, uh, whether it's outdoor, whether it's nature, whether it's cultures, is heritage, or uh, you want to connect with, or whether you want to connect with yourself, these are the uh, uh, the touch points, right? And the emotional touch points that destinations today who have been very creative have, have gone out and continue to be in touch and communicating with consumers. Now, when you when you say this, okay, now my question to you would be, which is obvious, obviously, is do I need to be in touch with the trade, or do I go to the consumer? Where where does the, oh, the destination? So, so look, this is a good question. Consumers are at home doing searches, right? And, and Google is probably your first point of contact when you want to do a search. So it, it's important that uh, we are in front of the consumer first because you want to excite. Now, when I get excited about a certain destination, I will then go to the trade and search what does the trade have to offer. So I think the first point needs to be with the consumer. The second point needs to be with the trade. And that is also very highly dependent on what market we're talking about, right? Just so we say people have behave differently towards crisis. Everyone has a different way of dealing with it. Also, in the same way, people behave differently in the way they buy, in the way they uh, search. So in, in countries where, let's say, Germany or China, to uh, uh, some extent, Russia, where you have up to 80% of travelers going offline, not online. Although the global average is 50% online, 50% offline, not direct and direct, but you have certain countries with language barriers who still want to go to a shop and, and, uh, and, and purchase. Take, for example, make my trip or take uh, a, a sea trip, right? Those are the largest online travel operators. In the same time, right, a company like Sea Trip has 3,000 retail shops across China. And you think you're supposed to be online. Why do you have 3,000 retail shops, right? <laughs> so that that is is a, the, you know the, the the trade is plays a critical role as well. But I think the first step for a, for a consumer to excite for a destination to excite the consumer is to to, to talk to, to to create that awareness first. Right, and because there's going to be so much, uh, I don't want to call it noise, but so much advertising. Right, it's how do you creatively stand out, and how do you 
take the time and make sure you're talking to consumers at the right time. For example, you know, when do we see the stars? When it's dark at night. So when it's, when it's quiet, that's when you want to talk. So I, I understand your point, but then why would I reach the customers directly? Why would I not reach, it, reach them through my travel industry partners? Wouldn't that be more effective? Wouldn't that give me a call to action and all that? It's not necessarily uh, effective uh, or not effective. Mm -hmm. I'm saying your first step, you would want to go to your consumers directly to create the excitement, right? And then because I'm going to search for excitement. And if, if a destination has excited me, the call to action is, is then up to me if I want to go to my preferred travel agent, if I want to go to my preferred hotel operator direct, if I want to go to my preferred airline. So you're, you're not necessarily restricting, you know, uh, uh, consumers only to go to trade. You've got to allow the consumers to make that choice. Okay. Still, still since we're sticking to the consumer, I really would like to ask a lot of countries, uh, a lot of other people have started getting these so-called cleanliness awards, uh, case in point, uh, if I may use this, WTPC awards and all that. Are these really... Uh, creative are they really have do they have an impact because the consumer doesn't know anything about WTTC because that's it's, it's a more trade organization is that yeah. a thing? look to me I think these are great PR uh, uh, drives that uh, some destinations used um, uh, to say that they are a safe destination but you can't claim that you're a safe destination because you've been awarded uh, a certain seal or um, and also, um, it's, it, it's not necessarily just giving a hotel operator or hotel company or a, a tourism establishment certain guidelines to follow and say, we are safe. Um, because you can't, you know, you need somebody to monitor this. You need somebody to audit this. And it doesn't matter whether it's WTC or any entity out there who puts out uh, these seals it's still the responsibility of the destination to ensure that they're implemented and they're audited. WTTC cannot audit the world, cannot audit the globe and every hotel, um, making sure they're implementing those guidelines, right? So these are, again, you know, PR, PR uh, lip service, as far as I'm concerned, unless they are implemented through the destinations, through the hotels, audited uh, through a governing body that makes sure that these guidelines are actually taking place at every step of the customer journey. All right, fair enough, point well taken. Okay, this brings me to a very, very important uh, point, which is which has been uh, bothering certain parts of the world. Uh, mice, as you did mention earlier, is, is a very, very important aspect of, of tourism. Uh, meetings, you can hold on, incentives, all that you can do later. But there's one aspect of, of uh, mice, which is called weddings which is very, very important. And uh, uh, if I may give you the example of India and some other countries where weddings are really 300, 500 more people, sometimes 800 people. Now, you cannot stop weddings taking place. That's life, that's going on by life. So what's, what are your points of view? What should, what should weddings be doing now? Should they go with those small numbers of 50, 60, 100 people or, uh, or go to another country which can welcome them? So what's gonna happen with mice and weddings specifically? So look, let's again look at the, the current trends, right? We've seen weddings go virtual um, with a small number attending um, uh, and, and a larger number attending virtually. Um, people who have attended these virtual weddings actually enjoyed it, said it was very nice. And, you know, it's, it's uh, the next best thing when you don't have the best thing, right? So uh, attending these virtual uh, weddings uh, or virtual meetings, look at us today, we're doing this virtually. It's convenient. Um, I personally do up to 10 to 12 meetings a day virtually. Uh, if I was in a normal uh, environment, I couldn't do more than probably five or six because you've got to account for the travel time. You've got to account for waiting time. When these virtual meetings are on, you, you basically are you know, in, the, in your seat and, and within seconds you're, you're, on, on, uh, you're on stage or you're in your meeting. So the, the, we've seen uh, uh, in the region, especially the UAE, opening slowly back to the wedding and the mice with uh, clear guidelines uh, for the hotels to follow and for the 
wedding organizers to follow, meeting organizers and uh, uh, meeting space, space uh, uh, exhibition space or meeting space uh, uh, landlords, let's call them, have also a strict guidelines on what they are allowed and not allowed to do in re-attracting and restarting meetings and events. Um, we've seen at the same time large exhibitions, ITV, WTM recently, all canceling. Uh, there's no clear visibility on 2021 uh, and uh, whether uh, there's going to be any, we know ITV has now uh, uh, gone virtual. There's nothing indicating that these large exhibitions will restart again not from anything more than also people having the confidence to actually want to go back to these uh, very crowded areas. So we've seen a growth in the hybrid approach uh, with physical and online. Um, I believe it's gonna take some time and we've seen many indicators showing potential baseline recovery in most segments for 2019, not until 2023. So if we, if we think, uh, you know, this ramp up and rebuild. We're, 2021, the first half of the year is going to be that ramp up and build up and reinstilling confidence, rebuilding confidence, you know, with a, with a, with, even if you have a vaccine in place, by the time the vaccine gets around the world and every human does have access to it, it's going to take some time. So the, that rebuild is been has been forecasted by various research and studies and various indicators that it will start around 2023 we're talking baseline 2020 okay so we need to wait but as far as weddings are concerned uh, what you're saying is get virtually married and i leave that to the people to decide uh okay now moving on in fact i'm saying with weddings uh, i'm saying look I, my recommendation with weddings is really follow the government guidelines the government guidelines is close family and friends limited number and the rest virtual so if you have a, a, an opportunity to rent a hall and people today are renting halls that fit 100 and putting 50 right to allow for physical distancing to allow for that uh, uh, a space in between. People are attending weddings in masks and being responsible. Wearing a mask is, is your biggest protection, right? And being responsible. So the more people are going to be educated and we've seen the region as a whole uh, really uh, controlling uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the hike in, in, in the number of cases across the region, right? Saudi was the first country in the region to close its borders and, and decide to really uh, put control on, on, on the spread. And the same in the UAE and, and the rest of the, uh, Jordan was one of the ones that had a, a quick uh, uh, grip on, on the pandemic and, and a, a quick recovery, a quicker recovery, if you like. So I think the, the, the guidelines are, are, are very helpful. And, and my recommendation is stick to the government guidelines uh, it, it, we can't stop living. We have to continue living, right? But let's live um, uh, uh, responsibly and making sure that we're following guidelines that are going to protect us and protect others. I, I love that word responsibility. I think everybody, if they could do that, things would be a different way. Okay, <clears throat> now actually we're running short of time, so we just want to wrap up. But before that, I really want to ask you two important questions. You mentioned that these uh, SOPs, which are which are in place now, as far as the new normal, the concerned, will continue even after the vaccine is formed and all that. Which which I agree. Uh, now the question is, it's it's a catch twenty two situation for the time being because what's happening is the hotels are at fifty percent. Uh, a lot of other places are really not uh, doing very well, and then you're going to raise your prices. How does the future look to you? Would would that really help fill up the hotel rooms, or what's going to happen? To, to me, I think uh, travel is going to go back to being a luxury, right? So if, if we go back, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago, travel was a luxury for people. Now, uh, the, the, the globalization, the, uh, the entry of uh, low-cost carriers, uh, uh, three-star three hotels, budget hotels, has allowed everybody access to travel, right? Um, uh, and, and it had made long distances become short um, in, 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 the new, in the new world, in the new globalization. Now, of course, that cost of travel 
um, uh, was uh, affordable for families to travel, for everybody. We reached a point where everyone can travel. Um, airlines uh, have uh, also put in place the physical distancing on the planes, uh, but they can't operate with anything less than 60% load factor, right? This is, becomes a, a, a total loss, especially knowing that airlines work on a very small margin and one or two percent is, is what they make. So it's, it's, uh, it's it, it, the only survival for airlines is for them to raise their prices. Uh, now this means that travel will become only if necessary, right? Travel will become for those who wanna to go to, on leisure if they have the means and if they can afford the travel. Um, and, and hence, the recovery is forecasted to take that long up to 2023 uh, because of all the variables that actually add up to it. And, and inc cost is, is actually one of them. Um, hotels, um, we've seen hotels in the region who have gone quite low on, on rates to attract demand. And I think hotels have realized that without the international travel, domestic travel gives them very limited opportunities you know during lockdown it's great but when uh, when you have countries that are back and open like the uae or saudi people are going to work so that means i can only go somewhere on the weekend now that is not enough business for a hotel just to operate for weekends only right so your your international travel needs to open up before you could you could start to look at recovery um, uh, or a sustainable recovery uh, hence the cost of staying in hotels, cost of travel, cost of, of, of uh, um, experiences it is going to continue to go up. But, but do you realize, Hatham, this is going to change the whole mix of travel and tourism now. So if, if the mass tourism in a way goes away and, and you're looking at the luxury and the high end kind of situation, that means my question to you now would be that the source markets for every country will change. Um, look, look. The, the pandemic has has had an impact on everything, uh, including uh, what we are discussing now. But it has an imp it has had an impact on major airlines um, closing, on major airlines reducing uh, uh, staffing, on major airlines reducing aircraft, uh, uh, discontinuing uh, new orders uh, for aircraft. Um, it has. Uh, had an impact on investors who wanted to build hotels, who have decided to, to stop. And it has an impact on existing hotel owners on what, how are they going to redesign their hotel to accommodate the new norm uh, of COVID. So all these variables, you cannot discount that the impact will also be on the segmentation, will also be on the uh, the uh, demographics will also be on um, uh, uh, which segment of society can afford to travel until we see that recovery. So for the time being, travel is going to be only if necessary. Travel is going to be expensive. And, and um, uh, uh, we see today PMCs and tour operators because they have to operate on small groups their margins are less, they have to increase the price. They're forced to increase the price. Otherwise, it's not feasible for them to run, um, you know, charity uh, tours. It's, 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 it, it won't be able, they won't be able to cope. In the same way, hotels who are running at 30% occupancy, they can no longer do the, you know, special offers and special discounts. And those who do will realize it's a very short term. They, they, they can't sustain going forward. No, but that, that's the thing. My question again would be now, that means you're going to look at new source markets to fill up your hotels or get the destination to get the number of international tourists. So what do you think no. be the Middle East, uh, what look at what? What would be the GCC countries, new source markets they will look at? What is going to happen at that stage? You know, look, I'm, I'm working on the, uh, with the team here on the Saudi tourism strategy. And I can tell you the source markets have been extremely fluid. Uh, with with the change of um, and the uncertainty of the spread of the pandemic and some of the key source markets that are not for Saudi only but for the GCC countries as, and the region as a whole and you know your your usual suspects is 
India, uh, uh, UK, Germany, Russia. Uh, uh, those are you know the, the, the top markets into the region as a whole, right? But we see now uh, that these, with the with the recent decisions of the UK, Germany, Europe as a whole, right, and and India as well, uh, it's not necessarily allowing destinations to forecast recovery or forecast what is going to be your top source markets. We, we're now going after what we call the green markets. So those are have, have been either less impacted by the COVID or have um, airports uh, open and operating, right? But, but, but then again, that's not enough to fuel uh, uh, the region. Those, you, you, need a, uh, you need a full recovery of those destinations for the region to come back to 2019 baseline. Um, and, and, and hence, this is gonna, gonna take some time. Uh, my last question, in a way, second last question, I would say is uh, recently uh, I'm like, taking towards the travel agencies now a bit because uh, re about uh, two months back, I think Pata had done a survey uh, globally where they came out with certain facts that 50% of the travel agencies they interviewed said that they will not be in this business because they never looked at it. Out of the rest, 50%, uh, I think 23 or 24% said that they were just waiting for another two or three months. If it goes beyond that, they may not be in this business again because they have not provided for it. So what's going to happen with the agencies now? Because they are the ones who are really have taken the biggest hit. And you think they will all survive or they will come back when the whole thing opens up? What's your take on that? Uh, look, we, we've seen a, uh, a huge shift for everything online during the pandemic. And whether you're ordering food or you're doing a meeting or you're, 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 you're booking, and the shift online has been tremendous. Um, uh, and I believe this is going to continue to a certain extent. The majority of people will continue to do things online. And there's a recent study that was done by the University College of, uh, of London um, which, which basically discovers that um, any human being or any person that does something as a routine for 66 days, it becomes an automaticity. So it becomes something you do automatically. So now we're in this pandemic for the past seven to eight months. So the things we've been doing are beyond 66 days. Right. It's, it, meetings like this, right, are beyond 66 days. And I think travel agents who have not thought innovatively on catering to consumers who are now gone into this automaticity of using online applications and websites, they certainly are, are going to be on the losing end. Um, OTAs, the online tour operators, I think have a brighter future. Uh, we'll see a surge in that. We'll probably see more entrance into the market. We'll see more entrance from meta searches um, into into the uh, into the market, and the use of apps. If we thought use of apps was high, then the use of apps will increase tremendously uh, as we go to the future. So, travel agents, you know, who have apps like Booking.com uh, and hence and so forth, those are creating their own survival uh, strategy going forward. Uh, the traditional uh, tour operators, I'm not saying are going to diminish um, because travel and tourism has always been traditional. And, and uh, uh, the travel trade and the way we conducted business until the pandemic was always traditional. We traveled to the same trade shows, we met the same people, we shook the same hands, we made the same deals. The offerings may change here and there, but it's a very traditional business in a very traditional industry. The generation who is used to buying in the, using the traditional channels through the pandemic got used to buying online because they've been forced to use the online channels. They've been forced to stop face-to-face -face and, and the human uh, contact. So we're going to see that shift as well from the, the generation who was doing traditional travel agent bookings into the online world uh, and hence uh, it's, it's it, you know either you're going to see more uh, mergers and acquisitions 
um, uh, or we might see, as you said, travel agents who decide we're just going to close shop, we're not going to continue with this. Um, uh, but the future is online. Okay, I don't want to thank you so much, but uh, before you go, I want to want you to do uh, give a message to this whole uh, GCC countries because with your experience from a hotel point of view, from a from a destination point of view, what would you really say? What should they really now the GCC countries be doing, and what should be their way forward for the I'm not saying long time, but short couple of months. What what would your message to them would be? Um, look, I think Emirates Airlines is, is a great role model. And um, I've traveled a couple of times between Dubai and, and, and Riyadh uh, after the, the pandemic. And I can, I can tell uh, you know, the region that um, if we ensure that we enforce uh, safety, uh, physical distancing and uh, sanitization guidelines across every touch point of the uh, customer journey from travel end to end, um, we will start to instill confidence. I, I travel and I'm confident. I feel safe when I travel. Um, and, and I think more and more people will start to feel safer uh, once they experience uh, the travel. But the, the destinations need to spend more time in communicating. You said earlier, not many people know about these WTTT seals, whatever. Let's focus on what destinations are doing and how authorities are working together with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Tourism, collaborating and, and letting the public know that there's a joint venture and a joint, a joint effort in bringing safety uh, to everyone who is traveling to these destinations. Um, the region has a great opportunity. It is already leading in recovery. It has a great opportunity to be the first region in the world to recover. Um, by simply focusing on hygiene, physical distancing, sanitization processes, and ensuring that those are audited in every hotel, in every airline, and in every retail shop that consumers go to. Fantastic. That was just perfect, Haitham. Uh, and I think this has been a, a great uh, learning for all of us. I think those who are going to hear it will be very happy with it. I think your experience uh, shows completely and, and we understand uh, the concepts, what you have in mind, the way you explained it to them. I think this has just been wonderful. Uh, thank you.